Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello friends, welcome back to this fourth lecture on the course on the psychology of language. At the very beginning of it, I will briefly describe to you what we did in the first three lectures. This recounting is uh, helpful as we can build a context on which the lectures are flowing. So this is lecture number four. Lecture number one and two, I introduced to you the concept of what is language. So we started off by looking at animal communication systems which are primitive language forms. We saw in detail some animal communication system like the honey bee wangle, the distress call overweight monkeys and some other form of animal communication system. We looked at why animals communicate through these channels and then we looked at some principles or characteristics of this language system. We added on to this by explaining how this system is difficult and easy at the same time. We describe some characteristics of this language system. Next we moved on to the human language system which is a more comprehensive system. We looked at the nature and principles of the human language. We looked at laughter as a model system and described how human language progressed. We looked at the idea of how human language progressed from a proto language looked at the characteristic of human language and how it is different from animal systems of communication. We described in detail the language system that humans use right from the phonology which is the speech sound, basic speech sound to morphemes to a word to sentences and to discourse. We explained what is syntactic structures, what is semantics and what is grammar in language. Then towards the end we moved up and explained the evolution of language, how human language evolved. We looked at the continuity and discontinuity theories of language. One theory saying that language development is continuous and how language develop follows Darwinian idea of change across species. We looked at the discontinuity theory which says that language developed as one spurt in one movement of evolution. We looked at the idea of Chomsky he talks about the language equation device and this is a brief of what we did in the first section. We of course also looked at Pidgin which are evidences of how language would have progressed from proto language and so more evidences towards the continuity theory of language development, human language development. This was the first two chapters or first two sections, lectures. In third lecture we started off by looking at how to do research in language. So we started off describing a language research and the research that we took, the model research that we took was the development of N400 or the identification of N400, it's an ERP marker for semantic incompatibility between language. We looked at what is a theory, what is a problem statement, what are variables and how these variables interact and that is the kind of thing that we are looking at. When we ended off that section, we were at the very core of looking at what is a problem, what is a hypothesis and what is an experimental design. The last thing that we discussed was in experiments, what is the idea of a between group and a within group design. And so in today's class, what we are going to do is continue from what we have done before and look at how do we test hypothesis. So, we described before what is a hypothesis? Hypothesis is a tentative solution to a problem. So, once we set up a problem, any problem, a research problem, this research problem, so as we are talking about, where we left off 
in the last lecture was describing what are within group and between group experimental design. Now, there we defined in the last lecture what is the importance of a hypothesis. We explained that hypotheses are answers, tentative answers to problem statements. Whenever we decide a research, whenever we design a research, we have a problem statement that we want to test. And this testing of the problem statement is done through testing the hypothesis. So, hypothesis is a solution. So, where does hypothesis actually come from? They come from theory. So, from the theory, we design some problems. Any theory predicts some problems. And they also give, based on evidences, a certain solution. So, what we then need to do is take the hypothesis, which is the solution, and test it whether what the theory is predicting as answer is actually the answer to the question that the theory is providing us. And how do we do that? By experimentation. So, in today's class, these things. So, what hypothesis then? A hypothesis predicts a difference between two groups. So, as we saw earlier, that any hypothesis testing or experimentation process in research requires you to have an experimental group and a control group. Experimental group is a group in which the independent variable, the variable of interest is manipulated and because of the manipulation of this independent variable, some change on the dependent variable is noticed. This is the experimental group. The control group does not receive the treatment, but then it does produce a change in the dv. So, with treatment change in dv is what the experimental group will give me and without change in the dv, a change in uh, without change in the, uh, the iv, the results on dv is what my control group will give me. So, hypothesis is believed to predict a difference between the groups. How do we test this hypothesis? Suppose we make a hypothesis that n, n 400 markers electrophysiological markers, they measure semantic changes in sentence processing. For that, we will need two groups, the experimental group will have sentences which are ambiguous in nature and the control group will not have sentences which are ambiguous in nature and we will do the ERPs of both the group on sentence comprehension task. And when we compare the mean amplitude or the ERP waveform for the experimental group where which read the, experiment, uh, the ambiguous sentences and the control group which have normal sentences, we can say we are comparing hypothesis that is what we do. So, how do we test hypothesis? The test of hypothesis is by comparing group means. So, we run multiple subjects to the same scenario and gather the peak amplitude for waveforms of interest and what we find is that for ambiguous sentences, subject CRP produces the N400 whereas for non-ambiguous sentences, normal sentences, we do not give the N400 amplitude in the ERP waveform. So, let us then take the Bradley 1975 study and Branford and Johnson study and see hypothesis testing is done. So, the hypothesis of interest in Bradley study was STM capacity limited by length not number of words. And so, this was the hyp hypothesis that the short term capacity, short term memory capacity is limited by the length how long a word is and not number of words, how many words which are there. So, the longer a word is, the more space it will take in short term memory rather than taking a number of words in itself and cramping them together and that is not the real reason we being explaining the capacity of short term memory. This was the hypothesis and we have looked at this research before. So, when we got our results in terms of mean number of words recalled. So, one group received large varying lengths of words and we are looking at the accuracy of how many words can we recall. So, the experimental group was re uh, receiving words which had length of 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and so on and so forth. And so, the number of words that they were able to recall, experimental group was able to recall that was the mean length of word that can be successfully stored in short term memory and on the other group was is receiving the number of words. And so, the result was that short word group was remembered better than long word group. So, we had those, those words which have small number of 
letters in it, they were remembered better than words which were long. Similarly, the Branford study in which the picture, the context helped us in comprehending what a text statement was saying. So, the hypothesis was context aid ambiguous picture comprehension and the result was picture group was greater than no picture group. So, when a picture was shown with text, people were able to get meaning out of the text more easily than when they were shown no picture. So, list of short words were recalled better than list of long words providing support for the phonological loop hypothesis that there is a phonological loop. So, list of recall of short words and long words and you can see short words are remembered more than long words. This is the badly experiment and this is the context versus non-context. So, when picture was provided. with sentence comprehension. So, this is mean rating ease of comprehension as you see it is 6 here 6 units and it is 2.2 units and so on and so forth. So, participants who first viewed a disambiguating picture the context condition rated a ambiguous story easier to comprehend than who listen to story without viewing the picture those in the context condition recalled more details from the story. Now, let us look at how an experimentation is done the experimental process. So, it starts the experiment designing an experiment or the experimentation process starts by formulating a hypothesis the expected differences in dv between groups. So, to start an experiment we first form an hypothesis and this hypothesis suggests that there is an expected difference between in the dv in the dv measure between groups. So, in terms of the earlier experiment the dv measure is ease of comprehension and so as you can see the hypothesis says that with context or hypothesis suggested that with context it was easy without context it was difficult on terms of dv measure which is the ease of comprehension and that is what we get. So, group A performance is greater than group B performance group A performance is if you have two groups A and B and let us say that group A is experimental group and group B is uh, let us say control group and so this suggests that this is what the hypothesis is suggesting and the results also confirm it. Design procedure expected to produce hypothesized differences group A treatment group B no treatment as we were saying the same thing. Once we make a group once we make a design and once we collect the data we need to analyze the data. So, how the analysis is done to determine if they support the data calculate mean of each group compare means. So, let us say A is the experimental group B is the control group and here ease of comprehension ease of comprehension this is with picture this is without picture. So, picture and no picture and so ease of comprehension in terms of dv. So, I get 6 the mean and here the mean is 2.2. So, as I compare the mean the mean for this group is only 2 and the mean for this group is 8. How do we interpret results if group A is greater than group B then hypothesis is supported. So, as I said ease of comprehension 8 is greater than 2.2 and so the hypothesis that we have is supported the hypothesis says that with picture you will be easy for you to comprehend a ambiguous sentence. Furthermore, statistical analysis may also be required and so this is, is this is very simple we used mean, but the more complex a design is if you are using factorial design nested designs nested factorial designs or any other kind of design <coughs> there we might need more statistical tools for analysis. So, that was the experimentation process of how we do experiments in research any behavioral science research and specific to the language. Now, the behavioral techniques what are the behavioral techniques that we use in doing research in language in very short form it is what is the dv measure what do we measure in dv when we say an IV is manipulated. So, we give picture in one group and do not give picture in the other group and look at comprehension. What are we actually measuring? So, ease of comprehension has to be defined and ease of comprehension can be defined either in terms of how many correct or how many times you have identified the gist of the 
story or it could be in terms of how quickly you can identify the gist of the story. So, basically in experimental uh, research there are two measures of dv that we use one is called the accuracy the other is called the latency. So, in psycholinguistics which is the psychology of language scientific study of cognitive processes involved in comprehending language producing language. So, psycholinguistics studies the cognitive processes which are involved in comprehending and producing languages. How does it do that? in terms of behavior. So, it is very difficult to look at the cognitive processes which is involved in language or production of language or any language measure. So, what do psycho psycholinguists do? They give subject certain kind of task and look at the behavioral responses and based on the behavioral responses then they can think back, predict back what is the reason for this kind of a response and in doing that they have to have some kind of a measure which is the dv measure which is what is the dependent variable exactly measuring. As I said there are two measures in experimental psychology there are two things that are measured in experimental psychology whether it is psycholinguistics or any other form of cognitive psychology. One is latency which is also called the reaction time how quickly can you do a particular job and then there is accuracy. What is latency? it is the difference in time between presentation of a stimulus and initiation of a response. And the more easy a task is, the more automatic a task is, the quicker the latency. This is also known as reaction time. So, one of the measure of cognitive psychology or psycholinguistics or experimental process is the latency. The other measure of dv in a psycholinguistic task or any cognitive task is accuracy. So, latency will tell me how quickly a task is done. This quickly can initiate or can tell us about several other processes or a lot about the processes which are involved. One thing that latency point out is that whether the processes involved in the question of under investigation is it automatic or not. Automatic processes have higher latencies, lower latencies, non automatic processes will have higher latencies. If a process is automatic it should not require time and show it to be quickly. Reflex is an automatic process and so latency will be less. If a process requires you to think then it should take time and that is why the latency should increase. Another measure or another dv measure which is used in psycholinguistics or for cognitive psychology that matter is accuracy which is the percentage of correct responses. Now, this will tell me whether you are able to generate the correct response or not. So, it will tell me about the processes which are involved the cognitive process which are involved in, in the question and investigation is in terms of correctness whether a correct response can be generated or not. And so, it tells me what are the processes which are involved in selecting the correct response. Error rate which is the percentage of incorrect response is another interesting thing which is looked at. So, the more error that I am creating the lower my encoding is or the worse the process under investigation is. The more error it is generating which basically means that I am not able to get the right answer and if I am not able to get the right answer which means that there is some problem with either the encoding or something some cognitive process is not working and so that is another measure of psycholinguistics experimentations. The best way to understand the psycholinguistic process the easiest experiment to understand or the model experiment that that should be a psycholinguistic experiment that can explain this latency and, and reaction time is the lexical decision task and priming. So, the question is whether priming and what is priming? Priming is the help that somebody gets in perceiving an object if that object has been shown to him before. If a partial object or part of an object is shown to somebody before will that help him in identifying the object again at a quicker speed that is priming. So, if I tell you about somebody beforehand some information about somebody beforehand it will be easier for you to identify that person often you go to meet your friends on an airport and you are going to welcome some stranger and so if you get some information that he is wearing this dress he is looking like this this is called primary. The more information you have the easier it will be for you to locate that person at the arrival hall and that is basically what is priming in very easy words. So, 
a priming task what I am going to explain to you is a priming task and we will look at whether lexical decision making is affected by priming. What is lexical decision task? Lexical decision task is finding out whether a word is whether a given group of letters is a word or non word. C U P cup is a word, but U P C is a pronounceable non word and P C U because you can uh, P U C is a word, but P C U is a non pronounceable because I do not know how you pronounce it Piku it requires a, a and so this is a non word this is a word uh, this this is a pronounceable non word and this is a non pronounceable non word and so the question in the study in this particular experiment was whether showing a word related to this cup may be a plate whether this helps in identifying at a later experiment whether you can identify cup or not. So, subjects were given some words to learn and later on at retrieval they were given an associated word and they had to quickly decide whether this word was a word or a non word. So, non words these are pronounceable letter strings that just happens to not like to be a word in English contrast with unpronounceable nonsense strings like this. So, you have uh, non words are of two types one is pronounceable the other is unpronounceable nonsense word non words and so lexical decision task participant sees a string of letters decide how quickly as quickly as possible if it is a word or a non word. Word trials present strings like this non word trials present string like this and so when the string is coming here and subject has to decide whether it is a word or non word just before this you either see a uh, uh, prime which is a word and you see a prime which is non word and so let us let us that is how you actually are supposed to uh, see whether priming affects lexical decision task or not. So, the lexical decision task is an easy task all you have to do is participants see a string of letters and quickly decide whether it is a word or not. There are two trials one is the word trial in which you see a word time or stem or in the non word trials you see words like this which are pronounceable. What is priming? It is an implicit memory process as I said you do not know or you are not able to decipher whether you have been primed or not and recall enhanced due to previous exposure. So, basically priming what priming does is it enhances your memory for that particular word. So, this is the chart of how this experiment was done. In the associated condition people saw a prime just before the probe. So, just before nurse was shown people were shown doctor and the response that people and the question was whether it is a word or non word and people said it is a word and the latency was fast because they were already primed. Now, when doctors and nurse goes together and so identifying nurse as a word when doctor has already been shown to you was easier. In unassociated condition a doctor was matched with a torch. Now, these are not associated words these are associated words and they are not associated word. So, although people did identify torch as a word, but they were slow because this was not priming this doctor was not helping torch doctors and torch do not go together, but doctors and nurse do unassociated condition doctor was matched to bench the bench is a pronounceable non word and so in this case people said it is a it is not a word, but it was very slow and so doctors was not actually priming it. In this case the latency was faster than this one and so what we were trying to find out is whether the time taken for you to verify this probe this word as a word or non word whether this was faster when it was preceded by a prime and whether this works for words and non words. Another kind of lexicon decision and priming example is participant heard the gymnast loved the professor from the northwest city who complained about bad coffee. Now, the question here was to look at how relative pronouns really work relative pronoun as you can see when I say who complained about or the relative pronoun who this who is actually representing the professor and not the gymnast and we are seeing that how 
uh, this is done how the relative pronoun how efficient the relative pronoun is is explaining the professor. So, participants saw and so we were testing whether this who if it is primed by a word related word and a non related word whether subjects were able to identify the meaning of who quickly or not. And so, participants or teacher at one or two before who so they saw teacher the prime word teacher before who was presented in one condition in the second condition they saw teacher presented after who pronoun who it triggers the memory for the processor uh, professor and so that is what we are we'll, uh, trying to look at whether this relative pronoun was how quickly they were uh, when uh, this who was there how quickly this who was able to identify the memory for the professor professor who teacher this is the relation so no priming at one so when teacher was presented before the word who people were not people uh, took more time to verify what who is specifying but in terms when who was followed by teacher and they were asked the questions about what who is specifying they were faster in telling that it was specifying the professor and not the gymnast so we can test syntactic processing in participants with aphasia. So, uh, this is important for aphasics or this kind of experiment is important for aphasics. Aphasics are those people who are not able to uh, comprehend sentences. And so, here we saw that when the prime word which is teacher was presented before the relative pronoun, it had no effect whatsoever on how quickly the trace for memory trace for professor is generated. But if it is the teacher, the prime word was presented just after the relative pronoun it was producing or people were able to verify professor memory for professor faster. As you can see in the after who condition Wernicke patients responded faster to relative probes than unrelated probes suggesting a priming effect. Higher Broca physics show no priming effect providing support for the hypothesis that they rely on semantics and non syntax comprehension. And so, Wernicke's people, people who had Wernicke aphasia, those people can produce sentences, a lot of sentences, but they cannot understand the meaning of it. In terms of what the sentence is saying, Broca's aphasia on the other hand, people with Broca's aphasia are not able to produce, they can understand the meaning, but they will not be able to produce the sentence itself. And so, that is what, what the test was whether priming was affecting people from Broca's aphasia or Wernicke's aphasia. And so, pronoun priming in Wernicke and Broca's aphasia as you can see latency in milliseconds, Wernicke patients, Broca patients as Wernicke patient after who condition a related probe versus an unrelated probe. So, if teacher was presented, so first we found out that after who the thing is working, the prime is working only after who and so what we did was. In one case, I presented people with, so in people with Wernicke aphasia and both with Broca aphasia. In one case, I gave a related uh, related prime to who, so the who was actually the professor and so I presented teacher here. In the other case, I presented cat and so I wanted to know whether cat led to faster identification of the memory of professor or faster identifying the word professor as represented by who. Then when cat was doing it and I tested it in Broca's and Wernicke aphasia and what I found it is Wernicke aphasia after who for related probes people took faster people were faster but for unrelated probes they were less in Broca's aphasia it was just the other way around which means that Wernicke aphasia people are able to uh, not process the meaning but Broca's uh, aphasia people are able to process the meaning but they are not able to process the sentence itself produce the sentence itself. Broca rely on semantics and not on the syntax to comprehend sentences. There are certain other things that we measure, certain the ways that we measure uh, memory in linguistics, in psycholinguistics. One way of measuring responses or memory responses for sentences or for uh, structure, sentence structures in uh, psycholinguistics is in terms of memory. So, there are two types of memory retrieval that we use in psycholinguistics. One is called the immediate recall, the other is called the delayed recall. So, if I give a subject a sentence to learn 
and if I ask them to retrieve back the sentence, this is called immediate recall. But if I give a subject a sentence to learn and after a delay of some time, let us say 1 hour or 2 or 20 hours or maybe 5 days and they come back and do the retrieval, this is called delayed recall. So, no time lapse between stimuli and response. So, if people are processing sentences based on semantics on, on, on syntax rather, then these people will have better memory here. But if people are using semantics for processing sentences, then they will have even after 20 hours or 2 days, the sentence will be easily processed and the gist will be easily recalled back. So, immediate recall no time, time lapse between stimulus and response and the test of short term memory. On the other hand, in delayed recall, time lapse of several minutes or between stimulus and response and it tests long term memory. This recall can be of three types, we can have free recall, repeat items in any order. So, I give you a list of words to remember and if I at recall, at retrieval, I ask you to produce the words back in any order you want, in any random order you want, it is called free recall. There is a serial recall, here when you recall back the words, you have to follow a particular order of recall. As you learned it, you have to recall it back and there are something called privacy and recency effect that you see in words. First and last items are better recalled than middle items, which basically means that if I have a word with three or four syllables, the first, so if I have a four syllable word, the first syllable and the last syllables are remembered better and this is called recency primary effect. You often seen <coughs> lectures by professors. So, when you are in that lecture, the professor is speaking to you and suddenly blah 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 and some new word comes in. It is a 8 or 10 syllable word or maybe 4 or 5 syllables, 6 syllables word. As soon as he produces the word, you tend to ask your friend, what did he say that word? And so, what the friend says, he says, he says and something something ably or bli which basically means that you understood the first word and the last first syllable and last syllable and between you could not hear and that is what is recency and primacy. Recency is remembering recently produced syllables which is still undergoing and primacy is remembering those syllables which have been produced at the beginning of a sentence, beginning of a word and so this is primacy and recency. So, first and last syllables were better recall compared to middle syllables in both the word list condition. Four words of one syllable each and the non-word condition, one non-word of four syllables were given to people. This is the result which suppose the hypothesis that multisyllable words are first processed as list of syllables. Overall performance is better than word list than non-word condition. So, here what happened is a uh, word and a non-word was used and four syllable word and non-word and so it was found out that primacy and recency happens in a word and non-word repetition. As you can see, this is the mean percentage correct, this is the serial position. So, the word here is ant riscolate, ant riscolate is the word and so when this is this was presented to people, people were able to remember ant and ate faster than risk and old and when it is a non-word or it was presented a non-word, the whole word was repeated and so as you can see the primacy and recency happens both in the, uh, the word and the non-word. Now, sometimes people also learn implicitly. For example, grammar is something that we learn implicitly. When a wrong sentence is produced before us, we can immediately say that something is wrong with the sentence, but we are not able to pinpoint what is wrong with the sentence. So, what is that is because we learn grammar implicitly. What is implicit learning? It takes place outside the conscious awareness and so what Reber did was he created an artificial grammar. So, he produced certain sentences or group of words following an artificial grammar and then he gave these subjects these words to remember. He also said that an artificial grammar is being used to form these sentences. So, first he formed some words with an artificial grammar. So, sample items like this and he showed people these words and he said that these are produced because uh, out of an artificial grammar. Later on at test he showed people these words and they are he asked whether 
these words are following the same grammar as these words are following. What he found out is that people were able to decipher the artificial grammar. So, artificial grammar learning task, Rayburn 1967, learning phase, subject study list of letter strings, sub, the, P, the PS told subjects, the participants were told string generated from artificial grammar. So, this is participants, they studied a list of letter strings, then they, they were told that the strings are generated from artificial grammar. In the test phase, the participants indicate whether novel strings are grammatical or not. Two alternative force choice response task was that participant must respond yes and no, cannot say I do not know. So, they have to either say it is this or, uh, this or this. And so, this is the task. So, the grammatical letter string task follow a path through which the graph whereas, ungrammatical letter strings like T, T, P, V, S do not. So, as you can see T, P, so T, P, T, X, V, S is allowed because this is the forward arrow, this is how my sentence is following. But if I say T and T, P, V, S, this is not allowed. T V S, this is not allowed. So, after studying a grammar string, participants were able to distinguish grammatical from non grammatical. So, people were able to generate this grammar that T and 2 P's or V and X and X and number of text. So, V X X or X X V S is gener can be generated, but V X X P S cannot be generated because this string is not allowed, right? And so that is what the task was all about. And so from that, he was Reber was able to un, uh, understand that people were able to decipher implicitly the grammar of a sentence. These are some of the ways, or uh, some of the techniques of doing research in psycholinguistics. Another interesting thing is eye tracking and reading. And so, uh, how does the eye move around? So, when you read something, how does your eye reads? So, the eye does two movements, one is called the, circa, the saccade, the other is called the fixation. So, whenever it is reading, what it does it? It fixates on the first word and the last word and keeps on jumping between words. The brain fills the between words. So, it does not read the word completely, it reads the first word or the first letter and the last letter of a word and the brain completes it, the whole word for the eye that is how uh, eyes do. So, I make something called circuit, these are quick movements of eyes while reading and then there is fixation momentary gazes of eye on single location. So, if something of interest, if if, uh, if the first word and last word is read through a circuit of the eye and if the word is a non word or if the word does not match the context, the eye does longer fixations and that is how the eye reads, it does not read the whole word, what it reads is part of words, the first and the last sentence and keeps on jumping across from one word to next word across the sentence and that is how it reads because had that not been the process, then it would have taken or it would take forever to read a text. Now, so the, uh, the two processes, one is called circuit, the other is called fixation and digression is movement of the eye back to the previously read location. If something wrong is the word, is with the word, the eye will move back to the previous location to correct it. This is how the eye fixations actually work. And to prove that eyes do not read the whole word, I have here. So, investigation of an internet hoax, uh, Reiner 9, 2006. If I ask you to read this, most people will be able to and this is because the eye is not reading each word. And so, it is very easy for us to read. So, according to research at Cambridge University, it does not matter in what order the letters of a word are, the only important thing is that the first and the last letter be at the right place. The rest can be a total mess and you can still read it without problem. This is because the human mind does not re read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. As you can see, I am perfectly able to read this but this is not according, neither this spells research, neither this spells Cambridge, neither this is university, neither this spell does not <coughs> on and so forth. So, how am I able to read it? Because the eye is jumping between these letters, making circuits and fixations and so, since does not 
fits with the context of it and matter and from what I am reading it is easier for us to read. Do it for yourself and you will see that it is easier. So, as proposed by the internet hoax story words with internal transpositions were easier to be read than words with either beginning or end. Of. So, if I replace the first word and last word the first letter and last letter of a word then people will not be able to read the word correctly. But if I replace in between items people will still be able to read words correctly and that is what the internet host was about and that is what this uh, they showed. So, however, contrary to the story words with internal transpositions were still harder to read than normally spelled words. The same uh, pattern of result was obtained for three measures of reading difficulty number of fixation shown percentage of regressions and average fixation duration. So, the number of fixations reading word with transport letters normals internals end and beginning. So, with the beginning number of fixations were more with the end transposition it was less still less but normal and this is internal. So, in with internal the number of fixation did increase, but not to this level. So, if you if you make transpositions to the end and beginning letter of a word then fixations are harder which or regressions will be more. Why regression which means that the eye has to look back at the word why it will be there because it, it is doing circuit it is jumping and so I has to spend more time on to it. This is another interesting research in psycholinguistics and uh, using the experimental methodology. So, then lastly we have to look at what is or what role the brain has to play with psycholinguistics or language processing. So, within the brain we have something called the brain stem which is the interior portion of the brain which regulates the body uh, function. You have something called the cerebellum which is a walnut size uh, behind brain stem coordinates movement. So, this, this is what my brain looks like and this is my spinal cord this region here this is what my brain generally looks like and so this re region which is hanging here which is called the old brain common in animals birds and humans is called the cerebellum it coordinates uh, movements and it is just behind the brain stem this is where my brain stem is this is where my spinal cord gets connected to the brain stem. Corpus callosum a set of fibers which run between the two hemispheres. So, band of fibers connecting the left, left and the right hemisphere and the cerebral cortex which is the outer covering of the forebrain mental functioning gives rise to consciousness. And so, cerebral cortex is the outer part of the brain which is more of white matter and inside the brain it is <laughs> grey matter. So, lobe and functional areas of the cerebral cortex we have the occipital lobe which is the right at the back of the brain this is the back of the head processes visual input. So, all visual input goes here. We have the temporal lobe which is the side of the head processes auditory input and object recognition. So, this is my temporal lobe right and so it processes uh, auditory input because it is connected directly to the ear and object recognition. I have the parietal lobe which is the top of the head this is my parietal lobe uh, and body position navigation through space and that kind of thing and the frontal lobe which is my front here of the head and motor movement planning decision making and so on and so forth. So, quick recap of what the brain looks like or what are the parts of the brain. So, if you look into here this is my central silica. So, two, two divisions of the brain it is divided this way and it is divided this way two divisions of the brain this is the lateral fissure central silicus this is my frontal lobe this is my parietal lobe this is my occipital lobe and this is my temporal lobe. Similarly, if you look at the brain in this way this is the cerebellum cerebrum or neocortex this is my brain stem and this is where my spinal cord get attached. This portion is called the auditory cortex this is the lateral fissure this is the region of the Broca area semantics related prefrontal cortex precentral gyrus or motor cortex this is the post central gyrus so somatosensory cortex. So, the movement here sensory in items here visual cortex and this is where my Wernicke area is all about. So, there is a difference between the Wernicke area and the Broca area. Traditional language areas. So, what are the areas of the brain which has been traditionally mapped or traditionally identified? Generally two areas have been identified one is the Wernicke case the other is the Broca area of the brain. So, lateralization some cognitive functions are processed mainly in one hemisphere traditionally language is left uh, is basically a left hemisphere uh, dependent thing. So, some specifics to you language generally is processed only the left, uh, left hemisphere of the brain having said that it is not only dedicated to the left hemisphere if there is a damage to the left hemisphere the right hemisphere takes on 
processing of language. So, there is a certain uh, language processing areas both the Wernicke and the Broca area is situated into the left hemisphere of the brain. But if it receives a damage, if the left hemisphere has a damage, this information is conveyed to the right hemisphere and the right hemisphere can then process a language. Spatial navigation or uh, manual dexterity motor works are which are uh, done by the right hemisphere. So, it is more spatial in nature, this is more linguistic in nature. Broca area, it is a left frontal lobe speech production area. So, speech is produced by this area and bro what is Broca's aphasia? It is halting effortful speech, good comprehension. So, people can understand words, but they are not able to produce word and that or produce sentences and that is called Broca's aphasia. So, Broca aphasia as I said, the Broca area is in the front of the uh, brain. So, that is what my Broca area is and this is a left frontal lobe and it is involved for speech production. I have something called the Wernicke area also or the brain has something called the Wernicke area also. This is in the left temporal lobe and it is for speech perception. So, understanding speech. Wernicke's aphasia, damage to the Wernicke area, what happens? Word salad, speech production, poor comprehension. So, people will be able to produce sentences and fluent sentences, but with no meaning and so damage to Ver uh, Wernicke area will have sentences with no meaning at all. Damage to Broca area will have no sentence at all, although subjects will be able to comprehend meaning, but not able to produce sentence. Wernicke area damage people will be producing sentences like anything, but these sentences will have no meaning at all. So, what is underneath the brain? The subcortical structures, brain structures located below the cerebral cortex, one of it is hippocampus, this is for especially for memory. It is a she shaped structure which is bilaterally present in your brain, it is in the temporal lobe, this area and it is used for memory and learning. You have the amygdala, a small peanut shaped a, uh, or kidney shaped region somewhere here in the frontal lobe. So, in the uh, frontotemporal lobe, I would say more of a temporal lobe and this is for emotion and memory. Then you have something called the basal ganglia, which is the base of the forebrain and it is for procedural learning and routine action. So, mostly motor action. Now, mostly when we talk about the brain, if you go to a doctor and he writes an x-ray, he generally writes something like anterior posterior or and uh, left anterior this is the kind of things that he writes before an x-ray. So, what are these things then? There are several navigation systems in the human body or several ways to study the human body and one of these navigation systems or how to express a particular structure is based on something called dorsal and ventral. So, dorsal is this side towards the top and ventral is towards the bottom. Towards the top if it is up then it is called dorsal superior. Towards the top it is towards the back of the brain, it is called prostery, dorsal posterior. If it is towards the front of the brain, towards the top, it is called anterior, and if it is towards the bottom, it is called ventral inferior. So, ventral is towards the leg side, and towards the head side is dorsal, front is anterior, back is posterior, up is superior, and down is inferior. Similarly, if something is towards the side, we call it lateral, but if something is towards the middle, we call it medial. So, there are several ways of division. For example, we have the sagittal plane, uh, several planes in which the human body can be cut. <coughs> so, AP is basically anterior posterior or AL is anterior lateral and so on so forth. So, this is, the, this is how we actually divide a particular area of the brain. Listening to the brain. So, how do we study the brain? There are various methods of studying to the brain. One of the ways of studying to the brain is the electroencephalography. So, what is it? The brain itself produces neural currents and this is what is measured. So, if some event takes place, these currents are generated by the brain and a measurement of this current using a reductionist technique will be able to generate or will be able to pinpoint that one change in the neuronal current that a stimulus of interest is doing and that is what an ERP is all about. So, if everything being same, a word is presented and a non-word is presented the change that the word is bringing in the neuronal current in comparison to the non word that is called an ERP. So, in, in electroencephalography it records fluctu uh, voltage fluctuations at the scalp. Event related potential these are waveforms extracted from the EEG signifies cognitive processes. 
For example, the N400 as, as we looked at the N400 is an ERP which is generated a negative going potential, a negative going peak. So, if this is my e, e, uh, ERP 400 millisecond past the onset of the stimulus, I find a negative going peak. This is my N400 and why does this happen? It happens because the subject sees a meaning difficulty. He sees a, a sentence where the meaning is the problem. For example, I take my coffee with cream and dog. Dog is a problem because it does not match here and so this sentence will generate an ERP because of N400. Why? Because the subject does not expect a dog here and dog is not fitting. So, he is comprehending the sentence and once he is comprehending the sentence, dog is should not be there. So, this is the electroencephalograph measures, electrical activity of the scalp, event, event related potentials can be extracted from the EEG and indicator of the time course of cognitive function. As you can see, this is what the cap looks like. These are uh, temporal 6, temporal temporal occipital 6, frontotemporal 8, these are the regions, these are the sensors which are there and so these are attached to a common box and ERPs are collected from it. I can also see the brain in action and that I do with something called either the PET or the fMRI. In positive emission tomography what happens is tracks mildly radioactive substance injected into the bloodstream. So, a mildly radioactive substance is injected into the bloodstream and then the experiment is done and I can <coughs> track in real time what is happening in the brain when a particular stimulus or what uh, when a particular word or non word is presented to the subject. I can also use something called the functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, it uses something called the bold technique which is the blood, blood oxygen level detection, it uses magnetic properties to track blood flows. It can track the amount of blood that a particular region of the brain or particular neuronal group of the brain is uh, taking when a stimulus of interest and a stimulus or non interest is being presented to the subject and this is what my fMRI looks like. So, a common brain imaging technique uses fMRI to, blo uh, to track blood flow in the brain under the assumption that regions of heavy blood flow indicate regions of activity. And so, this is a comparison of the EEG and uh, the, uh, the ERP and the fMRI. The technique here is EEG, the technique here is uh, MRI, the temporal resolution as well as in time. So, how accurate data can it give me on the time axis on how an event is happening. So, ERP an excellent, but fMRI poor. In terms of structure, look where exactly the changes are happening. ERP has a poor spatial resolution, it, can, it cannot, although it can tell me when an event has happened, when an electrical change has happened, but it cannot tell me where the electrical change is coming from. And fMRI cannot tell me when an electrical change has happened, but it can tell me where it is happening and so this is the comparison between the fMRI and MRI. So, basically what we did today is we looked at what is the hypothesis and from there we progressed into looking at the experimental process, how experiments are done. We looked at some model experiments and we defined these model experiments and how these model experiments are actually carried out. So, we looked at a number of studies right from uh, the picture, no picture, ambiguous sentence comprehension to uh, Bradley's uh, study and some other study as well. Then after we did uh, define how experiment presentation process is done, we looked at a model experiment and expanded the model experiment. And then what we did was we looked at the experimentation process, we looked at uh, lexical priming decision task which uh, explains the, uh, the experiment process in detail. We looked at how memory is used as a technique or as a measure for uh, uh, psycholinguistic tests. We looked at implicit learning and implicit learning tests. We looked at eye tracking as a measure of psycholinguistic uh, phenomena and then we looked at language and the brain of how various brain regions are related to its uh, various language properties or various language phenomena and towards the end we looked at how fMRI and MRI can be used for measuring psycholinguistic phenomena or psycholinguistic problems. When we meet next, we will look at how speech is produced in the human brain and what are the various issues related to the production of speech. So, up till we do that, it is thank you and goodbye from here.